Ladies and gentlemen, my talk raises the question how Kant's conception of the ethical state might prove relevant for the current debate on a global community. Some introductory remarks. Elaborating on the ideal of a social order that fully meets the demands of the moral law, Immanuel Kant distinguishes two kinds of state. The juridico-civil, political state uniting human beings as citizens under public juridical laws and the ethical civil state uniting human beings under laws of virtue alone. The current debate on the notion of a well-ordered society does, however, focus primarily on issues of right and justice. It seems that Kant's conception of the ethical state is considered obsolete in the mainstream of social philosophy as well as in the public discourse inspired by it, and thus is left to a few Kant scholars. The following reflections examine the sources of the widely shared prioritization of issues of the liberal state and the kind of loss that has resulted from this theoretical term. These issues will be discussed in the light of sociological research in the conditions of contemporary life that highlights one problem in particular, the propensity towards an atomistic isolation of the individual that leads to a disintegration of social bonds and dwindling solidarity. One crucial finding is that these social pathologies are rooted in the fact that the logic of market economy has intruded into all spheres of life. For instance, Fred Dallmeier maintains that competition and agonistic struggle are causing processes of social atomization. This talk examines whether Kant's conception of the ethical state might prove relevant today as it provides valuable tools for addressing the deficits of an exclusively legalistic approach to social issues and for elaborating a more comprehensive idea of a truly human community. Part 1. A procedural transformation of the categorical imperative. It seems a widely accepted view today that Kant's definition of morality in terms of self-legislation of pure practical reason has become obsolete. The way in which John Rawls maintains that his conception of justice has its foundation in Kant, has provided one crucial basis for that view. It is important to be aware of the linkage established here. By claiming with reference to Rousseau and Kant that a state in order to be legitimate must be based on an ideal contract agreed among all citizens on equal terms, Royce considers this ideal contract to be corresponding with the basic terms of Kant's thinking on morality, as expressed in the conception of the categorical imperative. Royce maintains, the original position may be viewed then as a procedural interpretation of Kant's conception of autonomy and the categorical imperative. In this manner, Ross eliminates the distinction between right and morality that Kant has insisted on, for instance, in separating the two parts of the metaphysics of morals, doctrine of right and doctrine of virtue. It is only on the basis of this clear distinction that Kant explains the relation between the two spheres, claiming that it is a moral obligation to acknowledge the ideal social contract. Significantly, Ross employs the term moral person as he refers to the citizen of the constitutional state. He notes that the citizen adopts the principles of justice that are derived from the conditions that characterize his being an equal in a society of moral persons. He goes on claiming that our moral principles are ob objective to the extent that they have been arrived at by assessing the arguments for them by the restrictions expressed by the conception of the original position. Elaborate, elaborating on Kant more extensively in his lectures on the history of moral philosophy, 
Rawls seeks to demonstrate the legitimacy of his reading of the categorical imperative with specific attention to Kant's concept, realm of ends. He that Rawls describes his, his conception as follows. Always act so that the totality of maxims from which you act is such that you can regard yourself as enacting a unified scheme of public moral precepts, the endorsing of which by all reasonable and rational persons is consistent with their humanity and with, would bring about under favorable conditions a realm of ends. In recent discourse, the expression Kantian tradition typically has been applied to Rawls and the many authors who have since adopted his reading of Kant. One approach in, inspired by Rawls is the discourse theoretical conception of morality elaborated by Jürgen Habermas and some of his disciples. Seeking to establish a post-metaphysical account of morality, these authors refer explicitly to Rawls's claim to a procedural interpretation of Kant's conception of the categorical imperative. As Habermas explains his own Kantian procedural account of morality, he emphasizes that in the absence of metaphysically validated normative principle, principles, moral universal justification can be located only in a process of reciprocal rational argumentation. Highlighting the universalist character of his account, Habermas contends that the moral community of human beings is the justification community for moral norms. Part 2. The pitfalls of the recipro reciprocal right to justification. As we take a closer look at the post-metaphysical suggestions to provide a procedural interpretation, we find first that this interpretation is based on the assumption that the genuine origin of moral issues lies in conflict among fellow human beings. Habermas maintains, for instance, moral judgments explain how conflicts among different actors can be resolved on the basis of rationally motivated agreement. A similar line of thought shapes Rainer Forst's conception of the right to justification. Forst emphasizes the right of persons who are irritated or offered by actions of others to request reasons. Correspondingly, he maintains that each person must, on principle, be recognized as a person with the right to justification according to the criteria of reciprocity and universality. As this brief summary clearly indicates, the procedural approach is shaped by the logic of contract. This understanding fails, however, to correspond to our ordinary way of looking at morality in several respects. As we seek to specify this incompatibility, Kant's moral philosophy provides valuable guidelines. Firstly, as Kant emphasizes, contractual agreements are by definition incapable of generating a moral attitude. Agreements on rules of actions can only concern the external aspect, the action as an observable process. Kant defines juridical laws as being directed, directed merely to external actions and their conformity to law. Regarding the internal aspect, that is to say the perspective of the agent, he contends, however, that I cannot be bound by contract to making a certain end my end. Secondly, locating the origin of moral issues in conflicts among actors fails to take adequately into account what is commonly called conscience. It does not reflect, for instance, that we may view some of our actions as morally wrong, even if no one has observed or contested them. One well-known literary example is the a repentant mode in which an adolescent's pair theft is narrated in the Confessiones. Significantly, Kant locates the source of morality primarily in the acting subject rather than in conflicts with fellow human beings. 
defining the differentia specifica of humans can't highlight the original moral disposition in us. As concerns the persons who are affected by our actions, there is a need for differentiation. In order to implement our moral disposition properly, we certainly have to cultivate our sensitivity as to whether others might be offended or harmed by our actions. In this respect, it is obvious that we need to engage in discourse wherever possible. The importance of such consultations does not, however, provide evidence for the claim of a procedural transformation of the categorical imperative. On the basis of this comprehensive claim, the moral evaluation of actions would be committed to the public, ultimately denying the relevance of the agent's conscience. Kant expresses a clear warning, stating that it is the pure attitude of the heart that represents true, true moral value. Yet this is never fully perceived by others, very often even misjudged. One significant aspect of the moral law is that, contrary to a common understanding, it provides a guideline for examining primarily my own ways of acting rather than so those of other people. From a moral perspective, it is crucial to focus on which re reason is or has been given priority in my decision leading to the action in question. Thus, the main focus of the moral law is on how I treat human beings rather than on how others treat me. Summarizingly, we find that the procedural approach fails to provide a theory of morality proper. Thus, there is good reason for taking a fresh look at Kant's account in its full extension. Part 3 – A system of well-disposed human beings Kant emphasizes that we are capable of judging our own ways of acting from two different perspectives, perspectives, from that of a citizen and that of a human being. Regarding the first perspective, he notes that the laws which regulate the relations among citizens focus on our actions in terms of deeds that affect other people, while considering individual motivation as a private affair. Citizens have the right to act in ways that are not explicitly prohibited by the law of their state. This implies that from the, perspec from the perspective of the political state, we are free to act immorally if only we are law-abiding citizens. Describing this fact, Kant introduces the term ethical state of nature. I'm quoting now. In an already existing political community, all the citizens are, as such, still in the ethical state of nature and have the right to remain in it. For it would be a contradiction for the political community to compel its citizens to enter into an ethical community, since the latter entails freedom from coercion in its very concept. As human beings, however, different from citizens, we are also fam familiar with the moral law, which constitutes the crucial criterion for judging our ways of acting from a moral perspective. This distinction resonates with our everyday experience. We know very well that to be a law-abiding citizen does not, by the same token, mean to, fulfi to fulfill the requirements for acting morally. One element of Kant's account proves crucial here. The thesis that while each human being has the duty to strive for his or her moral improvement, these efforts will face enormous obstacles unless the individuals cooperate. Quoting again, the highest moral good will not be brought about solely through the striving of one individual person for his own moral perfection, but requires rather a union of such persons into a whole toward that very end. 
that is, into a system of well-disposed human beings in which the highest moral uh, good can come to pass. Kant explains the need for such a union in drastic terms with reference to Hobbes, transferring, transferring the concept of the bellum omnium in omnes from the political sphere to that of morality, Kant portrays in detail the social deficiencies constituting the ethical state of nature. As long as the individual remains in circumstances defined by that state, Kant argues, he is opposed to moral perils coming from the human being to whom he stands in relation or association. Envy, addiction to power, avarice and mal the malignant inclinations associated with this assail his nature as soon as he is among human beings. Nor is it necessary to assume that these others are sunk into evil and are ex examples that lead him astray. It is enough that they are there, that they surround him and that they are human beings. Discussing these perils Kant emphasizes the need to establish a union which has for its ends the prevention of this evil and the promotion of the good in the human being, an enduring and ever-expanding society only designed for the preservation of morality by counteracting evil with united forces. Highlighting the social implication of this duty, Kant contends. In addition to prescribing laws to each individual human being, morally legislative reason also unfurls a banner of virtue as rallying point for all those who love the good, that they may congregate under it. With regard to a common misunderstanding, it is important to underscore that these reflections do not suggest any modification of the conception of the constitutional state. Kant rather insists on the need to establish both the political and the ethical civil states alongside, yet clearly distinguished from one another. Examining the relation between these two types of state, he points out that the ethical community can exist in the midst of a political community and even be made up of all the members of the latter. Kant argues since the duties of, uh, of virtue concern the entire human race, the concept of an ethical community always refers to the ideal of a totality of human beings. From this universal perspectives, perspective, there exists a tension between the two types of states, since the ethical state abstains from any logic that draws a line between we and they. It clearly has a critical potential with uh, regard to practical exclusion. All this said, the question arises where we might find an ethical community, at least in a rudimentary form, or how we might have to go about establishing one. Concerning this question, Kant introduces a link between the spheres of moral life and religion. Part 4. Founding a Kingdom of God on Earth Kant maintains that the concept of an ethical community is the concept of a people of God under ethical laws, arguing that the idea of an ethical community cannot be realized by human organization except in the form of a church. Presumably, it is this claim that has led many readers to lose interest in Kant's conception of the ethical state altogether, due to the fact that in many parts of the, of the world, religion has lost its appeal for substantial segments of the population, which rather adhere to agnostic or atheistic convictions. However, considering that the conception is an integral part of Kant's moral philosophy, it seems worthwhile to recall key arguments elaborated by Kant, notwithstanding the mainstream sweeping dismissal. 
the crucial thesis is that the laws of virtue cannot be taken as having been laid down by humans. I'm quoting. If the community to be founded is to be a juridical one, the mass of people joining in a union must itself be the lawgiver of constitutional laws. And the universal uh, we thus we thus establish an external legal constraint. If, however, the community is to be an ethical one, the people as a people cannot be regarded as legislator. For in such a community, all the laws are exclusively designed to promote morality of actions and hence cannot be subject to public human laws. As Kant at this point takes up the belief in God as moral ruler of the world, he does so with a decisive qualification. He emphasizes that, laws, that ethical laws cannot be thought of as proceeding originally from the will of the superior, for then they would not be ethical laws and the duty commensurate to them would not be free virtue but an externally enforceable legal duty. With, the, with this caveat, Kant claims that establishing a church amounts to founding uh, a kingdom of God on earth. Ultimately, this mode of linking the spheres of morality and religion defines Kant's philosophical approach to all re religious tradition rather than only to those shaped by monotheistic conceptions. Referring to the previous epochs of world history, Kant maintains that the great diversity of religious narratives and practices may be viewed as so many efforts to realize within their respective particular cultural contexts humanity's most demanding moral task. It is important to note that Kant's approach opens up a critical perspective as well, which concerns the institutional realities of religious communities. Elaborating this point, Kant adopts the traditional distinction between visible and invisible church. In his observations on the realities of religious communities, including the Protestant church he belonged to, Kant applies this distinction, noting that the sublime, never fully attainable idea of an ethical community is greatly scaled down under human hands. The most pressing problem Kant addresses is based upon the fact that, as institutions shaped by humans, churches commonly have adopted political models of structuring monarchical, aristocratic or democratic paradigms. In this manner, statutory laws laid down by church authorities have tended to get into the way of the moral law. Kant warns that obedience to them would involve not only the morality of actions, but only their uh, legality. With regard to, this, to his own time, Kant pleads for revising the widely held misunderstanding of the normative consequences, competences of church authorities. It seems legitimate to read Kant's claim in more general term as insisting on the distinctive sacrosanct character of the laws of virtue. This reading allows us to assess his thought as suggesting that the genuine moral teachings that are contained in each traditional confession can be fully brought to light and made available as practical guidelines only by detaching them from hierarchical pressures that seeks to establish a heteronomous mode of acting. Part 5. Raising awareness of what is missing in the contemporary life world. In response to the fact that today many people seem convinced that Kant's conception of the ethical state 
does not prove relevant in any way, let us proceed step by step. First of all, it is important to consider that Kant provides well-argued critical tools. For instance, his explanation that even in an already existing political commonwealth, all the political citizens as such are in an ethical state of nature may prove helpful in analyzing current social challenges. It allows highlighting that even just institutions cannot prevent a gradual corrosion of social bonds in both the private and public sphere. As Habermas observes, severe social pathologies have been generated by unregulated processes of market economy. He, uh, he notes a tendency to the transformation of the citizens of prosperous and peaceful liberal societies into isolated, self-interested monarchs who use their individual liberties against one another like weapons. Further challenges, by the, are cre further challenges created by the aggressive attitudes that are increasingly impacting on social life are, for instance, hate speech and malicious or disdainful attacks often transmitted to the public via so-called social media. As we face such current phenomena of an ethical state of nature, it seems worth recalling Kant's claim that a public discourse on morality is needed. In his Reflections on Enlightenment, he argues that it proves a tall demand for individuals to leave entrenched behavior patterns on their own, but that a public should enlighten itself is more possible. Indeed, this is almost in and inevitable. One might think that in a secular age, when most people are no longer involved in pondering over moral issues in a religious context, a public discourse on morality is even more desirable. Such a discourse would have to take up the issue of implementation. How to establish a community in which people would mutually support one another in the cultivation of moral sensitivity rather than by being drawn into ever more hostile attitudes. Kant sketches a complex relation between individual and shared responsibility, responsibilities, while it is a duty for every single person to become a member of an ethical community, the creation and support for such a state depends on joint action. Kant points out a meta level here, arguing that this moral duty must not be understood as one duty among others, rather duty as such represents the leading concern of action. Furthermore, Kant introduces a global inclusive perspective as he elaborates on the ideal of a society with, I quote, reason makes it a task and a duty of the entire human race to establish in its full scope. Kant e explains that here we have a duty sui generis of the human race toward itself. This thought implies that it is only under the roof of such a universal union that the diverse obligations, as specified in philosophical research on virtue, can be carefully cultivated. Of particular relevance with regard to the idea of forming a realm of virtue are Kant's reflections on moral education, not only for children, that I cannot go, uh, that I cannot treat any further in this paper. These reflections do, I think, sound plausible in the present context as they allow addressing what is missing given the, the widely shared social habits of today. Let us now turn to Kant's thoughts on religion. First of all, his point of view is certainly of interest with regard to the current conf conflicts with religious connotations. Kant's prime focus is not 
on addressing the disparities or similarities of religious confessions on the surface level, as it were, but on considering their shared basis in the purely moral religion. From this perspective, every creed since humanity's earliest religious ideas has intrinsic value. In this manner, Kant provides an approach to a religion based on esteem, which is an option for believers as well as, well as agnostics or atheists. Yet, Kant suggests an even closer link between atheism and religion as he elaborates his thesis that religion is originally rooted in every human being. Any historical faith, he argues, has been anchored in the search for the ultimate sense of human existence. Facing the notorious rift between morality and happiness, each human being is bound to raise the question, what may I hope? While emphasizing that this fundamental existential issue cannot possibly be resolved by humans in the course of their own life or in the course of history, Kant contends that everybody's faculty of practical reason does imply, obeyed in an implicit manner, a natural religion. The germ of a, natu of a moral proof of God, he suggests, was lying in the mind of man when his reason first quickened into life. Against this background, Kant determines the task of philosophy in terms of elucidation rather than invention, noting this moral proof is not in any sense a newly discovered argument by his philosophy, but at the most only an old one in a new form. Kant summarizes the logic of the moral proof in terms of the highest good emphasizing that virtue, as worthiness to be happy, is the supreme condition of whatever can seem to us desirable, and hence of all our pursuit of happiness, he argues, virtue and happiness together constitute possession of the highest good in a person. As he explains, to need happiness, to be also worthy of it, and yet not to participate in it would render the human existence ultimately senseless. Thus, as, as my moral obligation amounts to making the highest good the object of my will, I must suppose its possibility, and so too the conditions for this, namely God, freedom and immortality. Thus, it is a need of pure practical reason to assume the existence of a supreme intelligence, that is, it is morally necessary to assume the existence of God. Elaborating on the practical character of this certainty, Kant introduces the concept of the postulates of pure practical reason, arguing that, conviction, that this conviction is not logical but moral certainty. I must not even say, he notes, it is morally certain that there is a God, etc., but I am morally certain, etc. Kant explicitly defends this conception with regard to persons who claim to be atheists, underscoring the difference between theory and practice. I'm quoting, atheism can be in pure speculation, but in praxis, such a person can be a theist or can venerate God. His error concerns theology rather than religion. Reconstructing this thought, Ellen Wood notes, what moral arguments show is that morally disposed people are involved in a kind of practical irrationality unless they believe in the future life and the providential and gracious deity. Kant claims, Wood states, that I can have religion in this sense even if I am an agnostic. This inclusive view allows Kant to state poignantly, 
religion is what is of interest to everybody. It is worth noting that Adorno and Horkheimer have adopted this claim in the context of their reflection on the horrendous crimes committed by the totalitarian regimes of their time. For instance, Max Horkheimer, in the interview published in the, in the Die Sehnsucht nach dem ganz anderen, the desire for the totally other, introduces a theology of hope of hope. Facing the tremendous pain that has been inflicted on innocent people, we find ourselves unable to accept the idea that there might be no ultimate sense, he argues. Even atheists would dismiss this idea, albeit unreflectedly, as they feel a longing that the murderer must not triumph over the innocent victim. This longing indicates a rudimentary theology of hope, which is based on the claim that the injustice which characterizes our world may not represent the final verdict." Unquote, Horkheimer. More generally speaking, it seems relevant today that Kant emphasizes the fact that religious creeds enhance the awareness of the unsurmountable finiteness of the human being. In particular, as we consider that in the present era of enforced consumerism, a hedonistic attitude prevails that tends to suppress the consciousness of finiteness and thereby, and thereby prevents meaningful ways of dealing with sickness and death. What follows from all this here and now in terms of individual responsibility? By conceding that the sublime idea of an ethical community is greatly scaled down under human hands, Kant underscores, yet human beings are not permitted on this account to remain idle, as if each could go after his private moral affairs and entrust to a higher wisdom the whole concern of the human race as regards its moral destiny. Each must, on the contrary, so conduct him, herself, as if everything depended on him or her. Furthermore, the idea of a moral community does not justify the view that we ought to make symmetry a precondition of our present actions. The moral law rather imposes on us a unilateral duty. I am obliged to respect and support others as persons, even when I have good reasons to doubt that they would behave likewise towards me. Pointedly phrased, Kant contends that the moral imperative appeals to the subject to make a beginning. With regard to the increasing social pathologies outlined above, valuable guidelines may be drawn from Kant's reflections on respect. Achtung. On the respect we are obliged to show towards all human beings simply because they are humans. He explains that while it is impossible to provide a positive, comprehensive definition of uh, the obligation of respect, we need to focus on attitudes that inhibit due, due respect. Kant specifies the vices of arrogance, defamation and ridicule, very well known vices. It also seems worth considering humble first steps towards establishing the community of virtue. Reflecting on manners such as sociability, courtesy and gentleness, Kant notes that although they do not contribute directly to the end of morality, they may promote the feeling for virtue itself, as they help to cultivate a disposition that allows at least to associate the graces with virtue. Why not heed this thought when, on the staircase of our anonymous apartment building, we meet neighbors whom we do not know by showing them our kind attention. <laughs>